Okay. Hello, Ranjan. Good morning to you. You're in Paddington in London, aren't you? I'm, I'm, I'm calling from Sweden, you know. Um, yeah, where, whereabouts are you? Are you out in the woods? I'm in the middle of the woods, in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. In a sort of a, in, a, in, 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 in a one elk town. <laughs> and you, a one can you, town. <laughs> can, you, can you get much further north than you already are? Oh, God, yes. I'm in the south of Sweden. The right. thing that people don't realise about Sweden is it's four times the landmass of the United Kingdom uh, with uh, one sixth of the population. There are 10 million Swedes, one million of whom uh, live abroad anyway. Um, so so the, the population density is incredibly low in Sweden. Um, and so even in the south of Sweden, which... Uh, I mean, most Swedes do live in cities. That's also true. And so most of the Swedish population is in Stockholm, Malmö and, and, and uh, Jettebury. That's Gothenburg to you and I. Um, and and uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's. Um, Sweden is very, very difficult, different, not only in its physical geography, but also its. um, um political geography if you like um and demographic geography to, to, to the united kingdom um it just is it's very 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 different mm. and and to give you some idea as well from the south of sweden to the north of sweden is the same distance as from the south of sweden to the south of spain to gibraltar same distance right okay um and you've still got the krona there right Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Sweden still has has the kroner, um, and uh, the, the Swedish people are opposed to going into the euro. Um, although they voted to join the EU back in ninety two or ninety four, whenever it was. Um, similarly, the really that late. Oh, we, Hold on, they only joined in ninety four. Yeah, uh, what happened is in nineteen ninety two there was a financial crisis in Sweden. Um, I, I was a property developer in London at the time and had lots of Swedish clients. Uh, but they liberalised their finance um, rules. Uh, their property developing class went nuts and they were well known for overpaying for properties, particularly in the city fringes. Um, and um, an ex-client of mine um, added to his not already inconsiderable fortune selling actually several sites on to Swedish mugs, basically. Um, and all that that little venture um, actually ended up pushing the Swedish economy into an absolute no, nosedive, which was very similar to what happened in 2008 in the rest of the world. And why that didn't happen in Sweden was that the banks banking reforms that were made in Sweden because of what happened in 1992 were still in force. Uh, and so Sweden um, hasn't had the same problems to the same extent as the rest of the world since 2008 because of that right okay interesting um that it is a disaster that forced them into the eu and at the same time it is dealing with that disaster that whilst it forced them into the eu prevented them from having the impact of a disaster as big as everyone else had well that's right whether they will be able to uh, because Sweden does export a lot, it's it's always been. It, people say it's a socialist paradise. It's not. It 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 has had a very liberal trade policy, um, and of course it came to industrialization much later than the, the the than the rest of the world. It was still a feudal society up until the late sort of nineteenth century, for instance. Um, and Swedish history is quite different to the rest of Europe. Uh, because Swedish neutrality uh, came into force at the end of the 18th century. So in about 1780, there was a disastrous war with Russia, um, you know, a famine and all sorts of things. Um, and the Swedish constitution was changed quite considerably at that time. Um, in fact, the Swedish monarch at the time, uh, who had been plotting a kind of an overthrow of, 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 of the parliament, um, was found out hauled in front of the Swedish parliament at the time, and they gave her a severe dressing down 
explaining how power flows from the people to the monarchy and it's not a top-down approach um and i mean you'll, you'll find that in all of the political um philosophy that that uh, you care to read um it, it's uh not, not about the Swedish experience, but, but the idea that um, to have a state, to have a government, uh, you have to have the consent of the governed. The consent of the government is very, very important. Do you think that 10 years into living in Sweden, you now have a slightly more Swedish intonation? I know you think so. I, I, it's possible that I do. <laughs> That was I, I, like Swedish chef. <laughs> I, I, I accept that that was incredibly leading in the way in which it was framed. Uh, but you have to accept that I did not know you before that when you were um, getting into fights in the East End. <clears throat> uh, so um, I don't know. Mm. Well, as Robert Burns said, uh, what a gift, a gift to give us to see each other as others see us. And so I don't know how you see me. So I don't, you know, I don't know. I'm not like Spode. I don't stand in front of uh, the mirror or whatever, donning my kneecaps and, and trying out phrases, etc. You know, in the, the Woodhouse thing that I sent you. Oh. Yeah, it was, a, it was a good video that you put together, though. Um, I like well, that. I was very pleased with it at the time. Um, I haven't put it on my BitTube channel. Uh, maybe I should because uh, it, it's only garnered just under 300 views in three and a half years and i think it's much better than that but obviously i do know my channel is i mean it was demonetized ages ago and and uh it's heavily shadow banned for instance i'll give you a for instance i can put a video up the same time on bitshoot as i do on youtube the youtube one will often have no views or little more than five views after a week and it'll have several hundred or uh, in the same period on bitshoot Shoot. Fucking hell, yeah, because you told me about that before and I just haven't got round to it. So I suppose in my own journey, uh, it's around three years ago yesterday, I think, that uh, or a couple of days ago that I interviewed John McDonnell uh, uh -huh. on, on video for Real Media, which is the first video I ever did. And I was trying to, because of various reasons, I'm having to do a kind of a bit of a mini audit on, you know, what it is to have been Runjan until now. Uh -huh. And so I recognise that it's about three years ago that I did that first ever video interview. And I, you know, someone else did all of the video work. I just asked the questions and organised the interview. But then within seven or eight months, snap election, and we were doing loads of interviews. Again, I was not using the camera. Um, but I started to watch over someone's shoulder in 2017, uh -huh. how that process works. Last summer, sorry, 2018 summer, I actually did the editing for some of the stuff and now three years on from the very beginning i did everything for that uh bob gill video yeah brilliant uh, video uh, i must say yeah very very thank, good video. thanks a lot so i'm saying that so that then uh, that's me essentially making my excuses for having been told about steam it and uh bit shoot but not having actually uploaded anything and now that you, you're telling me what you're saying it's far more meaningful because of a little bit of lived experience and a few scars uh, to be able to upload to BitChute now uh, mm. because um, I really might upload something decent there. And even if it isn't, I don't care. I've just got to get on with uploading it. You'll find your your audience on BitChute and what it feeds into your blog um, will be, from my own experience, for what I put out, it's about 10 times more audience through that. It's a much fairer kind of um, gay, you know, I think I think it works and cuts through much better. Um, so for, for the very big YouTubers, just, just looking at it in reverse, for instance. So if you say, if you look at, say, something like Paul Joseph Watson's figures, or even Donald Trump's figures, because the White House puts stuff out on BitChute these days, um what oh yeah um and uh, but 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 effectively their figures or, or, or info wars they, they they put stuff out on big big shoot their figures that they used to have on on youtube were huge with the advertising revenue you see um 
And uh, that platform for the endorsed bits uh, of uh, YouTubers, it's much smaller because obviously the number of people who have BitChute is smaller and the audience there is, is actually not filtered by the biased YouTube filters. Mm. Um, but it's a very inter it's a very interesting comparison to make. Um, but uh, anyway, in terms of geeky audience numbers and all the rest of it, let, let's just move on briefly from that. Just just so our viewers know, Ranjan, uh, Bob Gill was the producer and writer of the fantastic film uh, The Great NHS Heist. Um, yeah, that's that's right. And the director was Drew McFadden. Yeah. Right. Okay. And you interviewed uh, Bob uh, last week, was it? Uh, yeah, ten days ago, I think, on Saturday yeah. last week. Yeah. Okay. Actually, um, no, it was. It was, it was you Saturday have interviewed him before. You interviewed him when you were at Real Media, didn't you? I, I think I stumbled across the interview. For yeah, that. that wasn't me. I didn't do that. Uh, the cameraman just uh, said, "Come on, Bob," and Bob just came straight out with it. So no, I didn't oh. do that. I, you know, I knew them all. But yeah. But there is some obviously history there because you did seem to know each other. But I think, I mean, the, the UK column have mentioned the the film. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, it's free to watch at the moment. Or, uh, uh, the, I think until yesterday on YouTube it was. Channel. Oh, was it until yesterday? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I actually put together a video of that where I cut in um, Tony Hancock. I called it Hancock's Half Hour um, and, and had Matt Hancock um, uh, cut into, into it uh, uh, along with the blood donor, um, Tony Hancock. Hancock's Half Hour. Um, it was quite a fun video. It's quite. It's, it's interesting to watch. Um, you know, oh right, uh, okay. Well, I, I, I didn't know that Tony Hancock was a blood donor, but uh, well, he made a, one of his most famous sketches. One of the most famous lines in Hancock's Half Hour is, um, he, he sort of says, um, "Well, how much blood do you want then?" And and and, and the doctor says, "Oh, only a pint." And he says, "A pint? I've only got eight. A pint? It's oh, that's nearly an armful. <laughs> I'm not giving an armful for anyone." <laughs> funny so i mean that, uh, that that is probably the most well one of the most famous lines of the whole thing the bbc have made a remake of all the lost episodes one of which is coming out at the weekend which is called the politician and is this I with paul merton no no it's another actor that's playing tony hancock Another famous actor. I mean, it's 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 up on on the BBC website. You'll see they they've re-recorded the lost episodes. One of which was the politician, because I I've been trying to find that because I it, it would be very interesting because I'm sure that uh, um, it will apply to this current crop of politicians that we have. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the other guy that's brilliant on this is of course uh, Peter Cook, um, and I think Jonathan Miller died a couple of weeks ago, didn't he? Did he? I didn't see that. I, 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 yeah, I think two people. That week that was Jonathan, Doctor Jonathan Miller. The, the, yeah, two people the, died on the same. Yeah. yeah, two people died on the same day. Jonathan Miller and someone else. And the reason why I think of Jonathan Miller when I mention uh, Peter Cook is because I looked up Peter Cook videos, and his obituary on Newsnight was um, uh, Miller was introduced. You know, was was asked to talk oh. about him, and he said. The thing about Peter Cook, you know, people talk about him being a satirist and everything like that. But you have to understand, and he, he made it sound like he wasn't actually that interested in politics. Uh, he was interested in the absurd. Mm. Uh, and if the political was absurd, then fine, it, it became fair game. But yeah. uh, and then yeah. they said he was very interested in the work of and I can't remember who the guy was. N. F. Something. I can't remember what his name was. But he did a film. So this is the person who influenced Cook. He did a film that's still available on YouTube called One Way Pendulum. Right. And I remember that it's got a guy, I can't remember what, a very famous English actor was in it. George Cole's in it as well. Uh -huh. And um, George Cole, for our American viewers, was uh, Arthur Daly in Minder. Yeah. And, this and, and also in all the St. Trinian's films. Yeah, and this film yeah, is yeah. absurd. It's about a British guy who works at a technology firm and he lives in his own world. And then there's a scene where he's upstairs at his mum's house where he lives and he designs a courtroom. And then suddenly he's got an imaginary judge and he's on trial. And mm -hmm. there's a scene where the judge says, right, so where were you on the afternoon of 13th April, 
you know, 19, you know, 53. He goes, oh, I was at Chesterley Street uh, selling gas uh, to whoever. And, wow. uh, and they said, oh, really? What's going on with that? And then he said, well, I think it's something to do with. And they started to talk about that book by Harriet Beecher Stowe in which Uncle Tom exists. And then they start talking about slavery. And, you know, the whole thing is just completely, you know, absurd. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, it made me just think, oh, right. Anyway, I took a little bit of that. I took some clips from that and turned it into a film, which has been viewed by um, absolutely nobody on um, YouTube. But um, it was really good fun. You know, oh, I have to look at that. I used to love Peter Cook doing Sir Arthur Greve Streebling. Right. One of his famous characters. But he's, uh, yeah, Peter Cook was uh, hilarious. Right, anyway, the reason we're talking, and here we are, 16 minutes in almost, is we were going to have a chat about the general election today, 2019, 12th of December, and it is a general election today. Um, generally accepted to be a, has been a fairly lacklustre yeah. point there, um, where I don't know if the establishment want lots of people to go and vote or not. One would think not, probably. Um, but I, I, I did a interview with a friend yesterday, Ranjan, and just ask two questions. The first question is, uh, how believable is Boris Johnson's slogan, get Brexit done? And um, uh, are people really buying that? It, it, it is, is Brexit getting Brexit done? And then the second question is, what are the, the real issues? If Brexit is kind of a I don't know what you'd call it, it, it a sort of a meme um, and, you know, get Brexit done is a sort of a meme. What are the real issues? You know, what, 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 what you know, when, if you unpack what people really care about, I mean, Brexit is just a name. It must represent something. What are the real issues? My so what was, the first, what, was the, what was the first question again? Uh, how believable is the slogan get Brexit done? Is it Brexit? That's the first question. And the second question is, what really are the real issues of this election? What really matters to people? Well, what, if I may, it, it, yeah, if I may feed back to you certain concepts that I have interpreted you as alluding to uh, in previous conversations, um, I know that unlike most people, when somebody says something, you say, oh, I'm going to check up and what they've been talking about and who they are. And I'll look, you know, underneath and um, make up my own mind. Um you know, not sceptical, but just, you know, having a look. Um, and so I remember that in business, they sometimes use the word unicorn, mm -hmm. um, indicating this sort of man's search for the absolute, something real when there might not actually be something there. Mm -hmm. um, and so unicorn Brexit is interesting. And then if you look at the other unicorns of our age, like WeWork, Uber, Airbnb, these types of things, which you've told me is venture stroke vampire capital, grabbing market share, um, mm -hmm. you know, where every customer is really expensive for these people to get uh, mm -hmm. to be able to service for free. Uh, then they underpay everyone to do it. And eventually lots of people get shafted, be they workers, be they investors, be they whoever. Um, but they've completely changed the way in which everybody behaves. So mm -hmm. from a social engineering perspective, I believe I'm just repeating what you've already told me, by the way, um, from a from a social. Well, engineering maybe that's why I'm nodding so vigorously in agreement. Yeah. <laughs> from a so, yeah. So from a social engineering perspective, it's you know, it's very real. Um, and the only way you will really understand any of that is if you do what you've done, which I haven't. Uh, but, you know, have a quick look at the balance sheets, have a quick look at the numbers and say, right, how is this sustainable? How is this real? What kind of projection? flow have they got before they think it's going to come in um now jacob rees mogg apparently said we won't know how well brexit works for 50 years etc <laughs> uh, and um what was the other one i remember somebody told me that you know how sometimes there's this uh what is it anecdote that uh, someone in china was asked what do you think of the french revolution and this is in the early 70s and he said it's too early to say uh, <laughs> A friend of mine who lives in Korea told me that apparently that's exactly what you said. I think you said that Pushkin talked about the the false, what are the, you said oh, translators. translators. Yeah. 
the translators of the what? The false. Um, Pushkin said that translators are the false horses of the Enlightenment. Right. So apparently, what was really meant was uh, the the Chinese bureaucrat was actually talking about the French 1968 revolution, mm. which had, which had just happened a couple of years before. But um, so with something like Brexit, which isn't actually slated as a revolution in most people's. Uh, Oh, what in France? Yeah, textbooks. exactly. <laughs> well, I think, I think, yeah, I think it was just moving on from De Gaulle, wasn't it? I but... mean, it was a revolution of sorts. But, um, I mean, I'm very interested in the French referendum of 1968, which has exactly the same proportion for and against as the Brexit. This is where they have a new republic, right? Something like that. That's right. And and yeah. um, the political economy of Gaullism is dirigism, uh, directed economy. Okay, um, and Pompidou was for the other side um, right. so that that's what they voted about a more centralized france or to maintain a more decentralized france and who won uh pompidou that's why it's why de gaulle resigned right a decentralized municipal sort of led thing lost. sorry that lost the decentralized manipul that, that, that so so de gaulle lost that's what he wanted um Oh, so um, it became it became dirigism. It, it became it, it well, no dirigism um, does have a very large component of subsidiarity. Right. De Gaulle was a very bright guy. I mean, he realised that if if you're going to have a state with a measure of, um, of of control of the direction of travel, you have to have subsidiarity. Uh, in a system sense, what it means is the feedback is embedded in the system. In that case, can I just point this out? You've got subsidiarity, which was a word that I hadn't come across until Brexit. And I came across it slightly beforehand. And I felt that I was relatively geeky, but I could see people well ahead of the curve on me on, on that word. Again, I haven't properly studied law, EU law, so only a little bit, but, you know, a long time ago. But um, so you've got the principle of subsidiarity, which I think of being to do with, you know, the centre and the fringe. And, mm. you know, where's the power flowing from? Um, and then you've got uh, in power distribution and inequalities within the UK. And then when you start talking about, I mean, I'm not, I don't want to linger on it, but, you know, Scotland. But then afterwards, you've got um, the UK, I mean, England, sorry. Um, so John McDonnell. So we're now comparing the 68 France okay. thing with um, uh, what's happening here. You know, John McDonald wants to have a national investment bank and all of this type of stuff. So they're mm -hmm. talking about spreading, spreading opportunity around the country, which is in a sense the opposite of what Thatcher did when she bet the farm on the city. Mm -hmm. um, but also in 1983, I understand that one day President Mitterrand did a bit of a volte face and just mm -hmm. said, fuck, fuck it, let's just go anti-inflation then. Let's accept 8% unemployment. Let's just accept that. Let's go yeah. for it. You know, some curve, I think, is it, is it the Phillips curve or something like that? The trade off where they mm -hmm. basically say, you know, do we do we sell more and have unemployment or do we have full employment? So in a sense, it sounds to me as though you've got 68 and 83 in France as inflection points in terms of mm -hmm. uh, national policy. And then you've got 2019 over here and this idea of unicorns. Uh, yeah. You've got one thing being put on the table and another thing. So is it the same as the Monty Hall thing? Where, <laughs> where they say, right, you know, either you get a goat or a car behind the door. There's three doors, yeah. open one, you know, and then, you know, you've got two to choose. Do you change? And I know that you're very happy with tactical voting, or you have been very happy with the concept of tactical mm. voting and flipping and stuff like that. You know, not the Lib Dem Labour way, but the other way, mm -hmm. um, you know, for the kind of respect in the referendum, you know, and, and allowing this. Well, to I, I, I think it, for everyone, um... Number one, in terms of subsidiarity, local communities, if a local community want to have a hard Brexiteer MP, and that's what they want, and they, they need to vote tactically to do it, it's perfectly, I think, sensible for them to do that in the first part of the um, system. Um, I, I would prefer that a larger number of people would outvote, but democracy is about, um, you know, on, on, it's like freedom of speech or all sorts of liberty. You know, you have to protect it of the, of, of the people you don't like. Noam Chomsky says, you know, 
even Stalin was in favour of free speech to people he agreed with. Um, so, I. So you, just, so you're not interested. You're not interested in a hard Brexit then. Um, I, I don't think such a thing exists. Yeah. I, I think it's a it's a term, a PR term. Um, I, I I think a clean break from the EU as it currently works it is a very good idea because the EU is an anti-democratic institution and it's baked into the cake as is austerity. Now, uh, just in terms of political choices, um, Jeremy Corbyn made a very good speech last night where he actually said austerity was a political choice. Um, uh, he made a much better speech in 2017 on the same subject, uh, but um, Austerity is a political choice. It's it's a matter of ideology, not a matter of uh, of empirical economic um, evidence. Uh, in fact, all the evidence is that it doesn't actually work. Uh, but it what? But on your point, unicorn Brexit. I like unicorn Brexit. I think it's very good. Um, there's a guy called Derek Wall, who's a Green Party guy that has been joint leader in the party, the Green Party. And at the time of Brexit, he he he. he put out a, a hashtag, a Brexit imaginary solution to real problems. So on Brexit, I think, um, I, you know, to answer the question, is Brexit, is get Brexit done real? Does it mean anything? Uh, I, I think it actually means it's anagram being extorted. Um, from the point of view of uh, unicorn Brexit, that's kind of getting to the same place. No, it's not real. It, it's a slogan. It's a slogan. So what lays behind it? What does it, you know, what do people really care about? What issues are cutting through? Um, and so you interviewed Bob Gill. We've been talking about that, about the NHS. Is health cutting through around James, you think? Do you think people are talking about the NHS, about the sick child on the coat um, thing? Yeah, I think they are. I mean, from what I can see again, I mean, all I can see is a little bit of the Twitter algorithm and stuff like that. But um, it's I mean, the video that I did, I uploaded it onto Facebook and it got a lot more action with very little push from me. Um, mm. And I don't really normally do that. And it's made me think, fuck, I should use Facebook a bit more. But then again, it's also to do with knowing that you've got someone who's been talking about it for ages. It was nothing to do with me. It was to do with the mm. fact that I put something there that was just going to go mental. Yeah. Um, so I mean, it went mental by my standards. If I'd have spent money on boosting it, then, as the French guy said, um, the record companies buy their own records in order to get to number one, and then it does its yeah. own work. Um, yeah. So you know, it could have it could have gone way more mental. But you know, I've got other things going on, so I didn't I didn't want to get too excited about the social consciousness. All right. Fridgegate was trending yesterday. Did you see Fridgegate? I saw um, someone had pinned the bit where Susanna from ITV goes <gasps> like that. And when yes. I watched, when I kept on watching it, I couldn't hear the swearing, but you know, I'm sure well, it, was. it was kind of whispered, but he, he's actually, um, apparently Boris's main guy. Not, he, they were calling him a minder, but he's not a minder. He looks like a bit of a thug, but, but he's not a minder at all. He's the press he's guy. He's advisor, the press guy. Yeah. Um, I mean, it looks quite handy. <laughs> I mean, so from, a, from you know how you were talking about unicorn. I mean, we were talking. You, you, you were talking spoke, about unicorn. I think. It's I know, but I mean, I, I I was just using you know the accepted term and also your you know interpretation of some of these firms. But um, you've got unicorn. But um, on the subject of pedo brino, which you know yeah. obviously they sit next to each other. Whenever I've managed to get a couple of words from you about what does pedo brino mean, you know you'll. You kind of allude to the likes of Keith Vaz, John Burko, but overall, but also in a bigger picture, the idea that there is compromise, that there is blackmail, and that mm -hmm. these are the things that really decide whether or not uh, someone yeah. votes in a certain direction when they're in a position of power. So if yeah. you've got all of that stuff going on, I remember hearing that um, Cummings um, had an affair with uh, Michael Gove. Yeah, and, well, that's, uh, I read that. It was it. Um... On the Wiki Spooks article on Dominic Cummings, it, 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 it talks about that. And the person that, that actually alleged it was the ex-defence um, minister, Gavin Williamson. That's where that came from. And then when yeah. asked to, to confirm it publicly, he said, oh, I don't comment on that sort of thing. 
Um, right. And th there's a very, very um, one of the Tory grandees describing Gavin Williamson. Okay, uh, mm. apparently uh, was waxing lyrical that Gavin has a beautiful mouth. He couldn't make this stuff up. <laughs> Is this, you know, it's the Secretary of Bloody Defence and this Tory grandee says, oh, well, you know, oh, Keith Whipp, but he's done. Oh, he has a, a beautiful mouth. And it reminds me of the um, Harry and Paul sketch uh, uh, of the two old duffers it, 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 sitting in the gentleman's club, sort of saying, hmm, is he qua? Is he qua? Is he a qua? <laughs> oh, dear. Anyway, on, on all of this stuff, Pete Brino and all the rest of it, um, Mark Sedwell's had a remarkably um, uh, un, unturbulent flight. No, no mention whatsoever of Sedwell. No mentions whatsoever of Ollie Robinson, uh, now of Goldman Sachs. Um, you know, it, 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 it's remarkable. And on Goldman Sachs, there was one interview with Boris Johnson. He was challenged by Nick Robinson uh, or one of the other interviews that he did as to, well, you haven't got a trade deal, have you? What are you talking about? All these billions that, that you know, this tidal wave of investment when Brexit gets done. And he says, so, so, he said, so, so, uh, uh, and Boris Johnson, the best he could do was, oh, well, well, uh, Goldman Sachs brought out a report that said, you know, there we are. Proof is proof be needed. Uh, Boris jo Johnson is Goldman Sachs guy. He's saying. Well, well, that's very interesting because when he was interviewed on Andrew Marr uh, and I was rooting for Boris Johnson. At I this think stage, that's the one where he said it because he didn't do Neil, of course. No, no, no. Au contraire, because when I'm talking about the Andrew Marr thing, mm -hmm. I'm talking about the month of May or April 2016. Uh -huh. We're talking in the run up to Brexit, you know, mm. and Johnson was not the official leader of the Brexit campaign, but you know, you, you mm. just think, OK, yes, you are. And because he has got we, we can now say he's got an enormously uh, intelligent wife um, who obviously was the brains oh, behind. Was, well, you know, yeah, good luck <laughs> with that. I don't think I don't think she's ex-wife yet, because I mean, are you I, talking about you, Carrie Simmons? No, the ex-wife is Marina Will uh, Marina. Yeah, Wheeler, exactly. Yes. Yeah. yeah, they're not divorced, are they? I mean, we'd know if they were divorced. Bloody hell! Well, no, I think I think they've had a quickie divorce. I, I, I'm Fuck not. Off. Have, but it doesn't take long to get a divorce. It's the, they can't get a quickie divorce. Are you insane? Because I mean, from what I understand, a divorce is a legal arrangement, yeah. dividing, and it's dividing up. When I lived in France, right? Uh, I, I did. Well, a, I have actually been divorced, and and um, hold I, on, hold on, just just to say this. Just just before you go any further, mm. you haven't just been divorced. You have been divorced from a lawyer. And I remember once being told, uh, oh, yeah, a friend of mine, he's, his girlfriend, she's a lawyer. They got married. Pause. And my friend said, you may as well set fire to your own balls. Uh, <laughs> And I mean, I'm not saying that you obviously you probably do. I, 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 I mean, I still love my ex-wife. I love my current wife as well, of course. But but um, I, I haven't got any beef with my ex-wife whatsoever. And our, our divorce was, you know, it happened. And, and uh, you know, we both. Yeah, but had, you're both. You're both cool. on, but, 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 that's you not, know, it's not. It won't be like that with Boris. It won't be like that with Boris. I mean, whenever their divorce happens, that is going to be a fucking meltdown completely. It's easier to do Brexit than it is to go through the divorce that he's going to have to go through. I, well, I don't think I, 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 I don't think so. I, I really don't. Do you know anything about her? You must have heard the story. Marina Wheeler or whatever. I, yeah. I, 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 I mean, I've read the same stuff that anyone, probably not as avidly as some people do. But... Waterloo train station. But... Do you know? Do you know that story? No. The Waterloo train station story is fucking brilliant. Basically, she apparently, uh, because whenever they, whenever they wrote about it in the papers, they would just say, "We don't know who this person is. We'll call them X." Um, but I think on the legal blogs, they just said, "Okay, this is who we're talking about." Um, basically, it's Friday afternoon. She's had a few drinks. Obviously, she and Boris have a kind of open relationship, so she's with another lawyer. And they get busy in front of Waterloo Station. And um, 
they're arrested and what like um, dogging? Sorry? Like dogging or whatever. <laughs> I suppose so, but in broad daylight in front yeah. of the fucking station kind of thing. You know, at the you know, the bottom of the stairs, round there. And um I mean it's you know, they're obviously I mean, hey, being a lawyer could probably you could have some, you know, fairly stimulating and experiences. I don't fucking know. Anyway, they got carried away and um, a cop is walking past. And so they were arrested and um, they go to the police station and she just goes. It's a fair cop, gov, you know, slap me. Uh, I'll take my uh, whatever it is, caution. And, you know, like that. Uh, but the other guy, he said, this is outrageous. I'm fighting this. Like that. that he was some sort of illegal, I don't know what he was. But he was, you know, I don't think he was, he wasn't at the top of the tree, but he was somewhere. And she basically just goes, now I'm mortified. You know, everything was cool. Now I'm mortified because this now will escalate. Uh-huh. So she then said, she did what Keith Vaz did, you know, talking about Pino Brino. She did the Keith Vaz. She basically said, hold on a second, I've just remembered I am on a certain amount of medication. And therefore, I love this shit, I love this shit. And therefore, the drink meant that my mind wasn't working. The combo. And therefore, whatever happened there, I have no recollection of what actually happened. Right. And therefore, we're talking about rape. No. And so the other guy, suddenly, he's gone from saying, this is outrageous. So then he's fucking on the line for rape. And um, he lost his career. You know, um, serious, the, the, the guy got done for rape. I don't know if he got done for rape, but he certainly lost his career. He was in line to get done. She was just, you know, ex. And uh, it, she just, she, the only reason why she did it was to get anonymity. Oh, God. And uh, so what I'm saying is, if we're talking about uh, those uh, types has of... Has that not appeared in the press, then? Is that... it, it has, but only as X. There's no name for her. Oh, good God. But it's her. That's the understanding. My word. Well, uh, it, well I mean, we're, we're gossiping now, and we're kind of getting slightly away from... Uh... No, no, because, I mean, we've been talking about unicorn subsidiarity, real pedo brino, and all of this stuff. Yeah, and well, I mean, it does I, go to the, the, the point of character, I suppose, and, and, and you can judge the man it's, it's, by... it's not just that, because pedo brino, the whole point of pedo brino, from what I understand, is that there are other forces at work that determine the surface vote. You know, if somebody said, oh, I'm a morally upstanding person, I'm going to go with principle, then you'd have yeah. different votes. I, I did a blog called Where Have All the Bastards Gone? Um, you know, the I love old the title. Song, Where I love the the title. Gone. Well, IDS is still in Chingford. Yeah, but, you know, where have all the bastards gone? Where where have Major's bastards gone? You know, I mean... It, it, well, that's who I meant, I Boris, guess. Yeah, Boris Gla- claims that all of the 650 candidates support his unicorn brino, his pedo brino. Um, mm. How realistic is that? But, OK, let's just get back to the second part of the question. What issues are, are cutting through... Um, I mean, I did a word thing on, on, on the last debate. Um, and, oh, uh, the word cloud. Right. Yeah, and health came out. Um, uh, so, 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 so that's that. Ob- obviously spending. Um, uh, my friend Mike yesterday was saying people want to know about health, education and law and order. And that's it. Then what about um, what about uh defense i said well i'd throw defense into that too um and then subsidiary to that then the one that all of the talking heads on media are saying are anti-semitism and truth um and politicians now i i laughed my nuts off this morning uh, adam price the the, the the plied guy has released a draft law saying that politicians should be prosecuted criminally for lying. There'd be none fucking left. <laughs> you couldn't make it. So we were talking about absurdism earlier. I mean, it doesn't get any more absurd than that. <laughs> but can I, can I, can I criticise you? Yeah. For having said that. Why? Okay, so, so I'm Adam Price, right? Yeah. And you're laughing at me. 
and, and here's me, typical. Look, they're fucking rigging it. They're rigging the game. Roger, he's a paid, uh, I mean, he's a sophist and he's rigging the game. I say, let's ban lying. And he's saying, you know, uh, no, we must all be free to lie. Well, but this is the whole, this is the whole point. I mean, um, Clark, Alan Clark, when, when he, when he confessed to being economic with the actuality, right? Well, you know, this is the, this is the problem of context and language in general. Uh, you know, it's the one man's fish is another man's puss on thing. I mean, it really is. Um, and, and well, it, well, well should, should we say this is not a Brexit? That's what I wanted to say before. You know, it, you know, it looks like a pipe, but it's a picture of a pipe. So we're yeah. back to Kaz Kazibski. You know, it's mm. you know, it's a disc spinning. It looks like it's a sphere, but it's yeah. not. Yeah. Uh, look, look. All so of it's, that... th this is this is not this is not democracy. This is not yeah. unicorn. This is not Brexit. Is what it is? Oh, is it? Right. No, it looks like it. That's right. But but uh, look, uh, just just going back to the point about uh, anti-Semitism, um, which, which is catching a lot of people out now because you know there've been candidates on the Brexit Party and the Tory Party. You know, all of those holier than thou sort of virtue signalers. Um, you know, it's got oh, oh, fuck me, they do it too. You know, yes, you know, anti-Semitism exists everywhere in society. Mercifully, it, it, it's actually not that widespread. Thank God. Um, and it's, it's being used. I, David Graeber wrote the best thing I've read about the anti-Semitism uh, the way it's been weaponized hmm. and, and and he wrote an article saying for his first time in his life he actually is 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 now um a bit more careful about you know uh appearing to be jewish um and i i i, I mean he's a brilliant writer and he always sort of gets you know he always gets his point across um and most of the time I agree with him on most of the things. But but that was a brilliant piece. Again, yet another brilliant piece by Graeber. Um, so. Uh, I think that's one of the pretend things that they try to wheel out to. to what, what, one second, Roger. One second. I've just in. one second. I've just got to do something. One second. Hmm? Sorry. Yes, darling. Just doing a video with someone. Is that okay? I'll be back in about 10, 20 minutes. Yeah. So sorry about right. that. Right. Couple of questions, look, because we've been doing for 43 minutes. Um couple of questions. Gut feeling. Uh, are we gonna wake up tomorrow to a Johnson government or something else? And um Oh, well, uh, something else. Uh, and and something the, else. the second question is high turnout or low turnout? What's your gut feeling on those two questions? Hmm. Um, I think I'm just going to say something else and high turnout. Right. OK. High turnout is, a, is an interesting one because I, I, I have no idea which way it's going to break. Um, but uh, do we think that the great British public are going to vote the scoundrels out? And all I can say is I bloody well hope so. Yeah, I mean, it's a very good question, the whole turnout thing, because apathy is um, is obviously a strong currency. And you can see they've really been. And the thing about the apathy thing, they've been pushing that. I've noticed them doing that for at least a year at the mm. beginning of the year on the sofa, breakfast BBC. They would turn around and they did this day after day. They say, are you Bob? Bob, oh, bored of Brexit, and they wow. would just, you know, they fucking created a term for it, um, mm. etc. And when I say they created the term for it, I don't mind sounding like I'm a fucking loon when I say that, you know. Oh, them, you know, the fucking cunts upstairs. I don't it's really care. That the establishment is the establishment is the establishment. I, 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 I almost cheered the other day. I, well, Corbyn called them the establishment. Um. And that, that is it. It's the establishment. 
everybody knows what the establishment is. OK, some people would rather sort of say, well, it's it's the Jews or it's the blacks or it's the Muslims or it's the fucking commies. It's this, it's that and all the rest of it. The establishment, the establishment is all, you know, has all, ha, ha, it, it's a remarkably syncretic and um, uh, exclusive club, which is all creeds and colours. And, and they invent the creeds and colours and, 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 and seek to divide them. That's part of the thing. So the establishment has everybody in it. It's not, you know, there isn't a dominant thing. That That's, so So Jeremy Court, I mean, he, I think Corbyn gets it. I mean, I, I did a blog comparing him to Chauncey Gardner in being there. Um, because he does say a lot of what, what appear on the surface to be really simple things. And of course, this is the grey space thing again, you know, you, you can colour Corbyn in according to your own prejudices. And he allows that to happen. Uh, but if you think a little longer on it, he gives you enough crayons to actually come up with something approximating a real picture. Whether you agree or not with what he then wants to do about that picture is another thing. But I remember I remember once listening to something on audio. It may have been a podcast uh, uh, either with the guy from the ICA. I can't remember what his name is, but he's um, got a possibly Nigerian name, Keshe. I can't remember what his name was. But I remember him saying, uh, when I was growing up, uh, I think I fancied white girls more than black girls or something like that. And then he said... Um, but now looking back, I'm able to see that maybe my tastes were manufactured for me and, you know, by whatever it was that I saw. I that everybody knows that the only distinction is if you're a tit man or a leg man <laughs> you know, or, or an ass man. I mean, those are the distinctions. Colour's got fuck all to do with it. It's well, I, I, have, <laughs> I have to I have to admit that personally, um, I am I am very much into. Uh, the shape, uh, which kind of blinds me to anything else. Um, so you know, all, all forms yeah. of tone, all forms of tone, yeah, you, you know, can, knock yourself tell. out. I can't really tell. Yeah. I, um, I, you know, if you're a bloke, I, I don't obviously, I'm not a woman, so I can't speak for women, but if you're a bloke, it, 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 it's about tits, but well, tits, legs, and ass. There's an old rugby song, um. Bums, bollocks and tits, bums, bollocks and tits. There's nothing as pleasing as fucking while squeezing bums, bollocks and tits. <laughs> well, on that subject, because, I mean, what we're talking about now is, and the reason why I'm saying this is because, you know, you're saying that Corbyn can say some pretty simple things and it's, um, you know, but you can colour it in whichever way you like or whatever. I remember once a good friend of mine, he said to me, this is years ago, he said, um, oh, yeah, I'm not into black girls. And I said, right, OK. Uh, and I said, is this your is this you swearing your oath to homosexuality? Um, and, um, he, you know, he, he virtually gave me the space to continue. I, so I said, because I know that he was into his you know, he, he would make them up, but he was he'd like to give off the impression that he was a quant guy into his stats, you know, in order to, you know, win yeah, arguments, yeah. make make things up and win. So I said to him, so let's say you have a 10 out of 10. It was sorry about speaking in these terms. So let's say you have a 10 out of 10 black girl and, you know, like subpar white girl. You're going with the white girl. Like, let me just get this right. Yeah. And he said, he basically just said, all right, you win. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, these are not models that are hard to fucking knock over. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, so yeah. I think that's what's happening with Corbo. You know, people people are saying to me, oh, no, no. it's remarkable that at the end of the campaign, uh, you know, he gets he gets through. I mean, the stuff that Ash, happened with Ashworth, you know, um, it, it's it's an incredible talent that he has. I mean, it's not just that he's a great campaigner. That's not it. I think what it is, is that he has he for all the supposed dogmatic stuff. He's obviously got, he's a good listener. People say that about him. He's a good listener. I heard someone saying the other day, he doesn't like to be criticised. I'm just not getting that. Did I, tell um, you, did, did I tell you the story about, not the last time I saw him, but the time before that? Um, the time before, so the second last time I saw him, 
it was probably 2013, 2014. And I was near Bloomsbury where we met. Well, mm-hmm. not where we met, but, you know, where we met up once. Yeah, when we met up in London, yeah. Yeah, um, I, was, I was walking down Bloomsbury. Saturday morning, I was going to the library, uh, mm-hmm. one of the university libraries. He was walking the other way. So um, he may have been on his phone. Uh, my, you know, I could see him coming. Yeah. So I said, all right, like that, because we've met before. Uh, and it was really interesting because I hadn't seen him for ages. And his head looks up like that, you know, from the phone. And you yeah. can see his face is lighting up even before um, he knows who it is. Yeah. He, know, he knows something good's coming. Yeah. And uh, and I go, all right, you know, so, you know, what are you up to? You know, and then I said to him, so by the way, let's say Ed Miliband does win. Mm. Then have you got your eye on anything? And he looked at me in this kind of, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, as if to say, you know, you yeah. perhaps have not been paying much attention. Yeah. But, you know, that's all right. <laughs> he, he, he said, I, you know, it's not that I have no ambition. He said, I would not be welcome in any sort of an environment like that. <laughs> And then he said, I'm very happy just looking at my constituents' issues mm. to do with housing and things like that. And when yeah. I'd met him 10 years before, I remember he seemed a bit more deciding who to talk to and stuff like that. Yeah. But here, you know, I'd gone from looking at him, looking at his feet mm. virtually, lighting up and then saying, I have no fucking ambition whatsoever. <laughs> like that. And then well, I thought, well, that, you're all right. Between you're all right. personal ambition and egotistical uh, you know, and in the modern age, people don't get someone that hasn't got the degree of ego that's required in the PR age. And that's why it's Osho. We, we, you know, we, we, we both like that essay that Osho wrote. Um, and that's it. I, I think if I were to describe Jeremy Corbyn, you know, as anything, politically, as a human, whatever it was, I don't know him. But to me, he appears to be centred, but centred in that Buddhist way, in the Osho sense of knowing his true centre. I mean, that you, way, the real centrist, you know, he's, he is at the centre of his being. Well, the sun, the sun, the the sun said that being is love. Well, you know, I, I think he, I mean, obviously, he's, he's, he's been a hit with the ladies in the past, but I, I think he has a, a real inner love. That, that I sense, you know, I mean, I sense that, I, I mean, I I feel personally I'm full of love. You know, I, sometimes yeah, I... No, you said, yeah. And I don't like that. You know, like like you mentioned earlier about fighting and stuff. Yeah, I used to fight. I, I've been a street fighter. I mean, I... Um, but the point is that I've kind of replaced the anger. Oh, well, fatherhood did this for me. I, I've managed to... Re- Basically, there wasn't enough room left for any hate anymore when, when the love for my children just filled my heart. And another friend of mine said to me, he said, Roger, he said, the thing about being a father is that you find this. He said, I never thought there was as much love in the world as when my first child was born. And when the second was born, I realized it was just this endless fountain of love. He said, I was amazed. Amazing. Yeah. Well, I think that. Um... Can you imagine going back, going, you know, oscillating from uh, Unicorn to Pete O'Brien and then back to Corbyn? Mm. Can you imagine what a threat to the European Union current way of doing things, him coming in and saying, listen, we're doing a referendum. Let's see what happens. Yeah, I, I, uh, and I think it's going to be the Norway option. I, I, but, re- but regardless, sense, you know, but re- I, reg- regardless, you know, that whole fight or flinch. You know, as you said, you know, Corbyn's approach is no flinch, you know, no fight. You know, mm. we'll, you know, we'll, we'll play the cards. He's like it's... a stretcher bearer in the First World War. Some of the most heroic people on the battlefield in, in Flanders were, were stretcher bearer, bearers, conscientious objectors. But they were on the front line and getting killed. But they were they were basically helping the injured. Fucking hell. And, and that's, you know, to me... I, I, I mean, Corbyn, in my mind, is like a stretcher bearer for for British politics, which has become a Flanders of of of, of, of this hatred, this division, and all the rest of it. So I kind of see him as a you know as a, as a very very brave man, a, a stretcher bearer on, on, on the killing fields of Flanders. I mean, that's 
Well, I think that if he, and that's a brilliant analogy, I think that if he, and speaking of Flanders, you know, up the road in Brussels, where they quite clearly are looking for, uh, I mean, you know, I think, I mean, I'm not looking at it that much, but that's still much more than fucking most people, because most people are just looking through the narrow, what they've been given through the BBC. Um, but, you know, the guy in charge of Atos about five or six weeks ago resigned in order to become France's commissioner at the European fucking commission. You know, that guy who he was making money out of signing people off as being well when they were actually sick. You know, he, he was part of the massive UK austerity program. That was just a tiny thing. He's got military interests. And so what, he's not... Did they appoint a, a commissioner in the end then under the threat of the EU legal act? No, 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 no. The Atos is a French firm, so he's a French commissioner. Ah, oh, uh, right. Yeah, his name is Thierry Breton. One of the firms that he has run is um, France Telecom, which used to be called Orange or France Telecom. That's the company that I think had one of the highest suicide rates anywhere uh, because of the transition from public to private. Yeah. Uh, loads of them fucking killed themselves. So, and I think, so he, he's the commissioner for the internal market, but that means defense and that means a bunch of other stuff. Yeah. I think it's like sort of procurement and all of this. And he goes, I promise I won't let my personal interests get in the way. I, I mean, the one what? thing I can say about um, Jeremy Corbyn, you know he would read his red boxes, which is something famously Boris never did as foreign secretary. All the civil servants complained about it. All right. So, so when they say he'd be a security risk or he'd be this or that, you know, he would ask questions. But, you know, how many leaks have there been from Corbyn? You know, I, I, you know, I, I think he is a civil service commissioner, isn't he? Or whatever it is. That, that, I don't know what that, that means. There are but... two grades of MP, and I think he's the upper grade. I, I, I forget what it is. Now. I think it's civil service commissioner. Um, it, some, certain MPs get that sort of uh, accoutrement, as it were, so uh, or appellation. So, so uh, going, back to, yeah, going back to the question, you said, uh, is it real? And then what is real? Mm. Um, so is it real? We've established that, Corbyn's real. I, I think he's real. Like, yeah, all, it's like and, him. He, and he, given that he is real, that yeah. means that his view on all of this is fairly flexible in the sense that he's he's thinking. I, I know where like I like O'Donnell, by the way. I, I really Mac, Mac, MacDonnell. Yeah, he, he yeah. bothered me. There's something about him. He, I, there's, well, he's he's still got a lot of anger in him. He's not. I don't well, think he's as centered. Well, or, no, or, it's uh, here's my take on this. Um, John McDonnell, um, I suppose I should be relatively careful in case he hears this, because I do have occasional contact. No, it's not personal. I'm just saying I get a... No, a no, no, no. I mean, you. mate, mate, I'm just, I'm, I'm talking about myself now, yeah. not you. Um, so I think this, and uh, he's not going to like this, but I don't really care, uh, because the election is almost over, and I don't think anyone's going to notice what I'm saying. Um, so I'm going to carry on. The thing is that the unions were so you know you, you give 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 and you take 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 that's how it works isn't it so the unions who's in the unions now who are the large employers in this country you know obviously you've still got you know some of the military stuff um but you've got the banks mm -hmm. and so how many people what proportion of the union money which industries is it coming from you know, if the UK has bet the, how, bet the farm on, on banking and most people that are give, making their contributions are in services, if that's true, if the mm -hmm. vast bulk of it. So that means the, the services unions are the ones that are going to have the hold the most clout um, when it comes to arguments. So then afterwards, I'm just talking about banking unions because banking and unions, they're already actually sitting next to each other in the sense that. The people that I know that were involved in whistleblowing in banking, they told me, for example, one person I know that was a um, whistleblower from RBS, mm. he, he said that when he was supposed to have some of his cases uh, going forward, he would turn up and his union guy would be, you know, sitting there at the meeting already on very, very good terms okay. with the people with yeah. the people from the top. So the mm. stitch up, so what I get nervous about is that I think that McDonald, even though I think he's good on the telly, and I think he's got his arguments well laid out and stuff like that. But I think in the background, every so often he needs a reminder of, yeah. you know, what I, direction, I, what, what, what faces what way. So Richard Murphy, he told me the reason why, 
you know, he went from being called the father of Corbynomics to then mm-hmm. falling out. When I interviewed him two years ago, two and a half years ago, when the cameras got switched off, I said, look, I've got two questions for you that I never asked you on camera, which I wouldn't ask you on mm-hmm. camera. Number one, tell me about your religious beliefs, because I understand you're a Quaker. You know, just tell me more about that, please. I'm interested. Um, and then the second question was, what the fuck happened then? You know, in 2015, September, right at the beginning, you were lauded as the father of Corbynomics. And then afterwards, you fell out and you fucking left them. And now you were all SNP. Um, and then he said, well, it was pretty simple. In September 2015, no one thought Corbyn was going to win. And McDonnell was probably on holiday with his wife in India, in Goa. And he comes back in September and his phone's been switched off. He's at Heathrow Airport, switches his phone back on. And it basically just says, John, you know, uh, your shadow chancellor, you know, let's meet up on Monday. And he's like, fucking hell. You know, I didn't know. You know, I, you know, I was on a you know, kind of detox flex. And um, in the first meeting, Richard Murphy's there and he goes, right. You know, so when you go toe to toe with uh, George Osborne, you fucking give it like this and you give it like that. And McDonald, I think he wanted to do a Gordon Brown to say, oh, no, we must stick to all of the original spending policies that we've already been used to. And, you know, we phase in our change. That's what we say. We phase in our change. And Murphy turns around. Murphy, who I told you, you know, we said he was a Quaker. Well, you and I have in common the falling out with Murphy. I uh, have. I, 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 falling I, out with him. Yeah, no, I know you have. I, mean, I don't know if I've fallen out with him at all. Um, I've I, fallen out. I, 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 no, well, I know. You said he moderated your comments and everything. Dishonest. And, and, and he resorted an ad, ad hominem to me because he couldn't respond to my, my proper argument regarding energy-based economics. Right. Well, I mean, you know, I'm not saying that he's not, um, you know. Anyway, the point is that this, this he is still a, me from his blog. Well, this is still a good story. This one. He basically turns yeah. around to, to McDonald and he says, if this is how you're going to be on your first day, when everyone's got all their hopes invested in you, I'm fucking out of here. And uh, <laughs> McDonald was just like, up, is it? You, um, just just on that, Murphy is a Green New Dealer and so is the. the McDonald and McDonald when he was interviewed and he said um, to whoever it was was interviewing I've dedicated my la- my life now to the climate crisis no yes no. he did it's on fucking television I mean just and I, I I did I made a comment on my blog saying this is probably the most mendacious statement of the whole campaign uh, you know even if it's true it's such a big fucking lie anyway. And it's for the banks, from the banks, about perpetuating debt and keeping the poor poorer. The poor must remain poor so they remain obedient. Jean Calvin, the Calvinist, you know, and Calvinism is, is, is the root disease underneath austerity. For fuck's sake, wake up! God, seriously, I... I heard him say that, and I, you know, I, I you know, I, I must banish the anger because God, it really makes my blood. Is that is, is 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 Calvinism? Is that coming out of Switzerland? Yeah, Jean Jacques Calvin was um, basically a Protestant, one of the original Protestant um, uh, uh, well, nonconformists, but but the Lutherans and the Cal Calvin. Because you know, because you know, you know, Calvinism. You know. Calvinism is the root also of, of, of Cromwell, sure, Cromwell sure, sure. Puritan, Puritanism. You, you, know, you know, John McDonnell went to um, uh, boarding school in Great Yarmouth um, in order to become a priest. And then... Uh, what, a Catholic uh, priest? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. And then went into, um, you know, trade unionism. Well, it would have like been... That. Well, if, if it was a seminary, it would have been a Catholic priest. But okay, I don't know. Otherwise, I mean, it would have been a cler- some sort of cleric, but, but we call them vicars. Okay, so the thing is that because John McDonnell, and I suppose this happens if you're in the opposition, either the leader, or in this case, the, the shadow chancellor, needs to be courting um, not epistemology, but ideas, basically. What are the trendy new ideas? It's a bit like Madonna. Right. When, when Madonna brings a new album out or if a fashion designer or an artist like Damien Hirst, yeah. if, you br- if you bring out a new album, a new oh. piece of art, a new whatever, what you do is you employ you employ 400 interns to do it for you. 
you know, and you do a bit of directing. Uh, yeah. so, I, I did a blog about Corbyn called Karaoke Politics. But, but, but let me just say, said, this, though, you know, I, I don't believe in karaoke politics. Yeah, but I'm not, I'm not saying that Corbyn... It sounds like you're this. advocating it, Ray Jones. No, I'm not. I'm explaining something. I, I'm saying Corbyn doesn't do this. Cameron yeah. did do this. Cameron yeah. did it. Yeah. Uh, I'm saying Madonna does it. Uh, right. You know, you hire the best producers and you say, there you go, it's me, but with the latest trend. You know, it's me, but shiny. It's, it's still me, but it's still shiny that's underneath. What, so that, kills that's what killed mate. That's what killed Pope. Never, yeah, but I mean, I'm talking, <laughs> but this is, and but this is, this is what unicorn, this is what unicorn vampire capital, this is how it works. Yeah. So this, this is, except we're talking about in the political marketplace. Are you, right? are you saying that John McDonald's in all that shit? Uh, yes. So it's a bit like it was um, Alistair Campbell, wasn't it, who, who prided himself on, on knowing the names of all the Spice Girls, but also was serving over, um, oh, what's she called? Uh, Miss oh, Dynamite? No. Um, oh, God, you know the one. Um, oh, God, Justin Timberlake was going out with her. Britney, Britney. Britney Spears, that's it. Yeah. yeah. But let me just let me just get back to this. So, you know, we're talking about, you know, fanboys and, 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 and stuff like that and the environment. So, you know, he says, I'm dedicating my life to the environment. I mean, I don't I know if that's true. I'm just going to let my dog out. Yeah. Yeah. He's sniffing at me. I'm going to say hello. Oh, hey. Just one minute. All right. Oh, this is so funny. Hey, Ranger. Yeah. Um, well, I think the thing is that in the background, um, somebody noticed some of this stuff and it's quite interesting. Mm. I, mean, I mean, it is a kind of conversation in and of itself, mm -hmm. uh, possibly a little bit monologue -y. So I'll try yeah. and make it, I'll, I'll try I'll, and make I'll, it brief. I'll get my coffee. Aha, the cafe. Oh, cool. Right, so... John McDonnell wanted to be the new Gordon Brown. No, what I'm no, no the, the the Murphy thing was mm -hmm. he basically just said right, okay, so fucking let's go in there, guns are blazing, you know, like Samity Sam, you know, in the Houses of Parliament, mm -hmm. you're, you're fucking shadow chancellor. And McDonnell said, hold on a second, you know, from a decorum perspective, surely we shouldn't just come out and just say we're here to fuck you on the first day. You know, should we not just pretend to be politicians at the beginning? before we tell them that we're actually communist revolutionaries, you know, who are here to destroy inequality. And, you know, so that's just an anecdote. And, and, and uh, Murphy said, you're not fucking hardcore enough for me, mate. Fuck you and walked out. So that's an old story. But um, what I'm saying is that right now, because in opposition in those four years, he gets to have everyone do overtures to him in terms mm. of ideas, and then he can cherry pick what he thinks is working. But it's all about you're not just taking people's ideas, you're taking people's ideas, but you're bringing them, you know, the personalities, some of them, you're going to put them in government and in, you know, and, and in the treasury and stuff like that. So the question is, who's he surrounding himself with in terms of ideas and in terms of the treasury, basically, because what's the treasury story going to be? Who are his top economists? Who are his top advisors? Who, who are his people that he surrounds himself with? And what ideas are they? You've made it very clear that he's openly saying climate, 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 which the EU did only a couple of days ago as well, didn't they? Right? Well, exactly. They did, they did their trillion, their trillion euro. And well, I mean, you know, if it's, if it's done properly, then brilliant. But that's not the same as saying let's do it and not look at what it is. You know, what is it? That's the question. But 
back to McDonnell in terms of ideas, because the thing is that it's quite possible to become a kind of idea whore and to just have like the top representative of whatever idea and then help that and say, look, I'm going to have all of the ideas living and breathing through my policies. But what happens if that's positive money? What happens if that's something completely the opposite? You know, how can every single idea live in the same place? There has to be conflict in the world of ideas. You can't just say we can all sit well, comfortably. The, the, the point about subsidiarity is is, is, is that it recognises that one size never fits all. But and let that's me just... the problem with ideology is, is that people try it on and, you know, take take ideologies and try them on. Well, like you're being very, you're, yeah, well, you're, you're being very practical. And I think what you're saying is going to what I'm saying is going to fit into what you just said, um, because you're very good at doing the structural overview of what is the bigger picture. So I'm just going to give you the more gossipy version and you're going to see, oh, yeah, actually, that you were right. Um, And that is that I heard that around 2016, 2017, specifically 2017, when the Corbyn surge happened, et cetera, et cetera, then there were people saying, oh, shit capitalism is on trial young people who will be more active when it comes to door knocking etc etc um they are not happy at the effects of the fact that there have been austerity squeeze all this shit so as a result of that how are we going to control the political marketplace in the future we are the city we are the bilderberg group how the fuck do we control the future and so what happened was a very particular think tank called IPPR, the Institute for Public Policy Research. I've probably mentioned this to you already. Um, They have always taken corporate money, but they were always a Blairite think tank. Uh, And, you know, they're referred to in the media as being left, but they're not. You know, they're taking BP, PWC, KPMG, bang, bang, bang. Well, a mate of mine looked at their balance sheet the other day, and then I looked at it, and it said that in the last balance sheet, unless they've done one in the last few days, The one for the year 2017, 2018, I think, or 2017, when they published it, it had three million pounds from the Department of Health given to it to do devolution, which is now going back to what you were saying about Pompidou versus, um, what's his name? De Gaulle. Yeah. So it was talking about devolution. And so Grace Blakely, she was working at Localis uh, about two years ago, three years ago, uh, four years ago, in fact. And uh, she was saying, oh, yeah, Osborne cities, you know, this could really work. Devolution for cities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, Osborne wanted to create a bond market as well for local authorities and shit. But she was saying this could work. Then she gets a job at KPMG as a health um, sort of managing consultant uh, and th- in Manchester. And then whatever the fuck that means. So she's basically prescribing privatization for KPMG uh, to local government like Manchester. Then she gets a job at IPPR North, who, as I said, are getting three million pounds from the Department of Health in order to uh, to push the idea of uh, devolution for cities and uh, health uh, devolution. So they're basically decentralizing the NHS and bringing in loads of opportunities for vampire capital. Then she goes to IPPR Central, where she's working with what's his name, Harriet Harman's son, uh, Joe Dromey, and these other people. uh, And um, IPPR are basically saying, right, it's 2017. How do we look cool for the kids? How do we penetrate that world? And so things like the New Economics Organizers Network, which I was kicked out of in 2015, they have their speakers um, kind of training to get trained to go on to uh, the big TV stations. She was their big star. And that's why she always gets called on TV, because the people that book for TV used to be part of the New Economics Organizers Network. But what I'm saying is there was a guy called Tom Kibasi. He was at McKinsey. This is openly. He's only just left. He was at McKinsey for 10 years. Healthcare practice guy, New York, UK, London, uh, and five continents with Bill Gates and Rockefeller Foundation advising on healthcare policy. He became head of IPPR and everyone started to talk about how they'd shifted to the left with that fucking guy. And, uh, <laughs> and, um, and they were saying, oh, Grace Blakely's on the TV. So in the same way, that Grace Blakely is a massive coup uh, for um, banking whenever she whenever she appears on mainstream media because she's like Oxbridge 
banking, KPMG, all of that shit, just pretending not to be. But, you know, she that is really where she's coming from. So in the cognitive diversity, she might say things that don't sound like that. But underneath it all, she's still down with that, in my opinion. And um, so you've got her and then you've got um, her boss, Tom Kibasi. And Tom Kibasi, he gets invited onto fucking Novara. Like, mm. So for her, going on Novara is normal. But him, he's been on there twice. I thought she was one of the presenters. I, I thought she... No, no, no. She just comes uh, on sometimes. No, just sometimes as a guest. But um, cool. Uh, but but it's. I think it's a bigger coup to get Tom Kibasi on Navara than it is to get her on BBC and ITV because he's a fucking McKinsey guy going on Navara. Ten years at McKinsey going on Navara, so he's portrayed as this fucking. Sorry. David Cameron was at McKinsey, wasn't he? I don't, I don't know. William I don't think so. No, William I think, Hayes. hey, yeah, Cameron only ever did ITV. I think he did a stint with them. I don't think so. I think I he was ITV. But anyway, what I'm saying is Kibasi, then they did this thing called the Church of England uh, Commission, and you had the Church of England, the TUC, IPPR, and some other fucking lefties, supposedly, uh, doing this commission. John McDonnell does the announcement talking about you know the future and stuff like that so what i'm saying is that ideologically they're all this is city of london ippr church of england and john mcdonald all this sitting is together. the green new deal and carbon taxing yeah um, well uh, yeah, um, yeah they, do, I, they I published a paper the other day not mine it, it's uh, by an academic called dr adrian wrigley and dr adrian wrigley um set up a research group um, called uh, Structural Finance Reform Group, um, which is now run by a guy called Robin Smith, who used to comment on the Gollum X1V blog. And Robin Smith, he's not, he's not, Robin Smith, he's not involved in money, is he? Melt Fund. I don't, if you've never followed the links on my blog to Melt Fund, it's hilarious. Right. It's a satirical, absurdist blog. Poking fun at, uh... but, but but just just before you make your point, I just want to say this because this is the last thing I want to say is that uh, when you're in opposition, you have to court all of the ideas and then talk about how you bring the idea on board, but also the people behind it to be spokesmen for it. Um, you know whether there's conflict or not. So he's doing all of that, but he's you know McDonald, he's doing all of that, but he's also close to RBS, City of London, and all of this other stuff because they is he, is, when you say close. Because they have to, they is it to the extent that they will that there won't be a run on the pound if we do wake up to a Corbyn led government? Yeah, exactly. They won't. I don't think they fucking will. But that's the threat, isn't it? And 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 and, um, certainly, economic history is badly written. It's written to mislead. Um, Yeah. One second. One second. Sorry. Sorry. Yes, darling. Sorry, yeah, I'll have to wind up soon. But all right, yeah. Uh, I, I, just, I, just to say, appeared on a platform about uniform basic in- income with with another professor guy. Um, guy standing. Guy standing. Is 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 this um, taxation for revenue is obsolete? End of story. Um, and uh, Beersley Rummel blew that one out of the water. Speaking to the American Bankers Association. Uh, basically in the in the late 30s early 40s whenever it was okay taxation for revenue is is obsolete now a a strong autocratic central state stalinist type affair or a fascist type affair um requires taxation as a as a tool for social control which is what it that that's that that's its use to to people that want to have uh strong centralized control over everything oh so um, it's not about the money it's about the control right okay it's about the control um martin schubick you just read martin schubick on what money is what you know how it works but adrian wrigley nails this in terms of taxation uh, i found it in the house of commons library okay and they submitted it uh, to some review or other in 2011 and it is the most succinct and brilliant description 
of how what is the purpose of taxation, how taxation works and how money works and how the banking cartel works in conjunction with the central bank. And OK, well, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to have to go. So um... read that paper. Seriously, it's brilliant. It, well, you'll I think find we it should on have a blog. I, 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 carbon taxation. I did it about four days ago. Um, I'm in, a, in the middle of a huge row at the moment with an American guy who, who's basically a eugenicist population control freak masquerading as a what they call a progressive over there. A guy right. called Kurtz. I've told you about him before, but we have. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I'm going to write an essay over the weekend um, uh, popping his balloon um, okay. on, on something he published back in 2000. Well, let's but, talk uh, again soon. For, <laughs> for sure. All right, Ranjian. Okay, Good, mate. Good talking Great. to you. Take Bye. Care. Bye.